All right, so now ready uh, for an active diagram from the deltoid all the way to the distal tip of the, <clears throat> the bone, of the hand bone. So here I am, uh, we're going to do an act more active diagram of an outstretched arm, kind of fingers, uh, maybe moving in some kind of active, active pose. And, um, and then I'll have my skeleton handy for reference and then a little bit of the ecrige arm for reference too. And then at the end of this, I'll add on a little tiny video where I put on the brachialis uh, uh, proper where I kind of uh, forgot to, to show you guys that. So now you notice I've got the gesture going and I'm feeling my way through the pose. You've seen me do this before with other videos. And I thought, well, I'll just go for it on the sheet here. So kind of feeling where the deltoid will be, feeling where the overall shoulder girdle, the rib cage in, in, in this region, and just getting a sense for direction and form flow. Okay. So with the deltoid and then the back here of this part of the scapula and then a beginning indication of the trapezoid, uh, the, the neck as well. And then getting a little feel of the volume of the muscles, the bicep, brachialis, as well biceps, brachial and then brachialis, area the forearm, the brachioradialis area, extensor carpi, uh, uh, radialis longus, and underneath the extensor and the flexor underneath, just slightly there, the olecranon, the elbow, all of that I'm, I'm thinking, but I'm just getting a sense of the volume of all of it to draw. And making a volumetric gesture uh, working here and then putting on a little bit of now of the the metacarpal area of the hand and to getting in into the phalanges there just getting a sense of where I want to maybe place the fingers through here and the part of the heel the pad of the of the hand and then nothing is any at all detailed and everything is very general very relaxed working on scale proportion gesture and feeling everything through a little bit and then maybe the <clears throat> underneath part of the rib cage would come through here a little bit this pose could be of a male kind of seated maybe reaching or grabbing for something uh, that's a possibility through here so we get a little bit now of the end of the the manubrium of the rib cage the top and the clavicle and then the trapezoid or trapezius, excuse me, trapezius, not trapezoid, trapezius. I get my bone, hand bone, carpal bone mixed up with my shoulder, neck area. There we go. So now it's a good feeling of what I want to do with the pose here. And now I can start to get more detailed and add, beginning to add the humerus. Now I've got the ball of the humerus, so I'll pull this out and show you now. We've got a more uh, a positioning here of, of, of what we want in through here. <clears throat> the ball needs to go in a little bit further into the the uh, glenoid cavity and what I just showed you but um, <clears throat> what's important is the drawing you use your bones and you if you have bones if you have, a, have an ecrge use them and draw from them try to do most of it out of your head and then when you need to do a little reference pull the reference out from them the best you can that will help you memorize all these. Now the greater and lesser tubercle here on the lateral side of the humeral ball in through here. So there they are where it's fitting into the glenoid cavity there, rolling that ball along a little bit, getting that set in, blending that through. And, and then that ball <clears throat> from the greater tubercle comes out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. A little tickle there. Getting that roundness. And then we come down with the humerus, the body of the humerus. There's the deltoid tuberosity right there on the, roughly will be located there on the radial, excuse me, the lateral side there. And then coming down to the olecranon triangle, the medial area, and then, of course, the lateral. And of course, that's going to be moved now because of the positioning. So we're going to have a good, that's a better view of the olecranon there. And the tubercle is kind of sticking out. She should be a little bit more turned out lateral, but pretty good overall. So getting a feel for that. <clears throat> and then we'll, where they'll come together and then make that cavity where the ulna will fit through. 
right in through in, in there. And then, of course, the ulna fits nice and clean in through there. It wants to grab on to the area underneath the trochlear, trochlear area on the other side of the, of the humerus ending of the body there. And we're going to come on down with the ulna. The ulna gets thicker in through here, <clears throat> gets more radial, uh, rounded, and it comes on down, and it will turn in through and then come on down to the end of this bone in through here. And I'll show you what I'm going to do with the hand. I'm going to start to manipulate those fingers into a pose I want, a little bit more graceful, kind of curved to arch, and the index fingers maybe a little bit more pointed. So close to roughly kind of close to that area, like so. Here we go, pretty much like that. Okay. And it's for you guys and also mostly for me too as well, just to give me a double check on what I'm drawing. And then down into the ulna and then we get into the styloid process where it gets more pointy on the lateral part of the ulna. Remember the ulna? doesn't move, the radius moves 180 degrees, roughly, and it gives you that bump on the edge, and now we're looking for the radius. They're not, they're, they're turning over, a, beginning to turn over a little bit, but not completely all the way in through there. <clears throat> and so we'll get the radius head on there, that carpenter's head. It's slightly shorter and through here and tucked underneath a little bit of the ulna and through there. That cylindrical head and then they'll they overlap here. The ulna overlaps the radius and the radius comes down. And the end of the radius is much, much thicker. They kind of do the opposite where it's thicker with the ulna close to the olecranon and the radius is wider as we get here. And then the, the carpal bones we're just going to group all together to a little tiny kind of blocky globular ball, <clears throat> if you will. In through here. And so let's double check its size really quickly, see how we're doing there. That helps. Make sure we get that as correct as we can, as accurate as we can get that. Through here, roughly, a little bit more to the side. I'll adjust that a little bit there as I point to it. <clears throat> a little smaller. And then we can start to get those phalanges and metacarpals to come out like so, that position like so. And so I'll get the gesture now more concretely of each metacarpal into each phalange. Metacarpal of the ring, excuse me, index, middle, and then get a, the linear rate, uh, rhythm of the metacarpals coming through and then we get to the ring metacarpal. Just the beginning flow of it, kind of like an armature. Keep this very loose. Don't be stiff here. And then we're going to tuck the pinky back in a more elegant approach, something like that. You can see my first attempt and then see how different my second gesture is from where I push it in and get more accurate. See the difference between those. And that's fun. That's why you keep, you draw very light and loose so you can adjust later on to your needs and to what you're reacting to to get more accuracy. All right, so, <clears throat> so we have everything now. Set in, I'll put the glenoid uh, cavity in, and so we'll see it in this in its aspect. We'll get gets overlapped mostly by the ball of the humerus. It's a triangle shape, and then we see the coracoid process coming back at us, pointing back at us. The old finger, old man's finger, kind of pointing back through, and then over that's the acromion. Acromion process coming from the spine of the scapula in the back. There's the back part of it, and then rounding out here, and then it will touch, of course, the clavicle right in through here. There it is, touching the clavicle. Of course, they get the ligaments attached to one another and then cartilage too. And then the clavicle will curve in and then come down and go to the medial part in the center of the rib cage, and then meet up with the manubrium in through here, and then we have the sternal manubrium and through your sternal part and through there and then we get the other part of it and we'll just leave that as a as kind of just an open gesture roughly in through there probably gets a little bit more in profile actually Tra uh, trapezius will be up in through here neck 
coming sternocleidal mastoid when we get a little bit of the mandible coming down and just the profile slightly of the jaw chin area just to get a feel for putting it more on together as well <clears throat> and then the other part of the scapula now the back part of the triangle floating on top of the rib cage remember it has a inner inner fossa cavity so the the subscapularis muscle will sit in there and then on top of that will sit the serratus interior muscle too as well so we have all that going on underneath the scapula even as we start to draw from the deltoid to the distal has a nice ring to it I made that up one day in a lecture I'm like okay I'll use that deltoid to the distal so the deltoid now is going to attach onto that that spine of the scapula come across the acromion process down and remember all of it attaches to the deltoid tuberosity right where my thumb is on my left hand right in now pointing to it right in that area proper and through there all three heads the major heads the anterior the lateral and the posterior will come to its insertion into that region. So attaching all through this area, a third of the clavicle coming down, attaching through, has that shoulder pad looking blocky, triangular blocky sort of space right in through there. And then of course after that we'll just get a feeling now of the biceps greater lesser tubercle, the biceps brache break, brachii, and of course the corco brachialis, which we really won't see here. I'll, I'll just kind of indicate it here in a moment. So that's the biceps brachii in through here. Just going to get the overall shape of it before I get into detail everything else. I like to get a general shape or form of all of it, find my linear my contour parts before I start to put on when I'm doing diagrams. It just helps a little bit. Sometimes if I don't, I get so focused on the muscle form that it gets off a little bit. It's hard to control. So the triceps area will be here. That's where they attach all the way down to the olecranon. So I'm just getting a general feel for them here. Up and over and through and they'll attach up and over. Biceps brachii, brachialis underneath it and then the brachioradialis on top there as it, as it curls over. Sternum a little bit. I mean, it takes, it takes a lot of knowledge to do this. So, so uh, you know, do a lot of copies. Copy me until you get a feel for it and do your own. But don't get too frustrated if they look a little awkward. Because mine did for a good while until I started to really put it all together. Brachioradialis attaching in through here with the uh, extensor carpi radialis longus. Say that at a party a couple times after a couple drinks. That should be fun. But they both come together, right? In through here, there's two of them. Right, and then back in here is the extensor and then the flexor carpi ulnaris, as well as the extensor kind of together. Mostly the extensor. Just to give us that contouring around, it bulks out here. And then the end of the muscle will be, and it gets more of a tendon that comes into the ulnar area of the, the carpal muscles. Okay. <clears throat> Bringing down, let's get a feel for more of the outer rib cage, maybe a little bit, and then maybe that's kind of slightly sitting down, so a little bit of the rectus abdominis and a little bit of the fat, maybe subcutaneous fat on top of that, just a little bit in through here. And then now the contouring of the top of the hand, which is relatively muscleless, and a little bit of the bone. I'm going to push the, the, um, the greater metacarpal of the thumb with the proximal distal out a little further, something like that, so we get a little bit better feel of all that. So there it is. There's the proximal and then the distal. Only two. The prox no medial here. Proximal, distal, or medium, middle. And these where these will all be. Let's get this a little cleared up, shall we, for the bones? So our first uh, index finger metacarpal. And through here, there's two large knuckled condyled heads, right? Like so. And this it's proximal, medial, a little shorter. 
and then the distal that more of a more of a point I kind of think of them as shark's teeth if you've ever seen shark's teeth if you've been in the beach you've seen you can gather shark's teeth I used to do that when I was a kid in, down in Galveston in Texas my grandparents used to have a beach house down there all right, so medial, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, meta metacarpal coming now to the end where the carpals are. And of course, all remember, all these attach, all the carpals and metacarpals attach by uh, dozens of ligaments, lots of ligamentation through there, crisscross and attached and over. It's so complex. It's fascinating. It's not really needed for drawing, but understanding it's, it's pretty fun to look at it. And then drawing now the metacarpals here, the proximal of the ring finger down. Because they start to start to curve around and get a little bit open. And a little bit more uh, foreshortened, just slightly. And then we have the proximal medial, and then the distal will start to curve up underneath, like so. A bit more foreshortened. You know, once you understand these bones, they're really not hard to draw. It just gets a little bit tedious. Anatomy is tedious. It's tedious, but it helps your understanding of human form. But you've got to be able to draw gesture and volume. And you've got to be able to control value. And, it, and remember, anatomy comes later in, in your learning. But if you know, some of you want to go ahead and push on. It's okay if you're in YouTube land or Vimeo, or wherever you're watching. These things get pirated all over. It's hilarious. And then now the last metacarpal here of the pinky, or last shorter finger, down in more of the side, slightly more side view of it, the head and through of the first condyle in the carpal phalangeal joint to the proximal. We're down, we're really going to bend this here, and then we'll bend it, and that's curving underneath and getting more foreshortened. So tubed under this, the proximum, this is the medial here, outward maybe a little bit further there, and then of course the distal will really be curved, kind of coming back up in a U shape, backed and touching the top of it. Here we're coming there, that's it, got it. <clears throat> and then the last metacarpal of the thumb as it's overlapped by the other somewhat and then cleaning it up through the proximal and just the, just the distal there. And I think we've got it. Okay, so the pollicis muscles, the Abductor pollicis longus will be in through there. Extensor pollicis brevis will come through and give tendon. A little filling out the forearm and the by the carpals and then tendons to the thumb. So I think we're ready now to to go now and start. But we'll work from the distal, excuse me, the deltoid, and work our way down to the distal tips, the fat pads of the fingers. So here we go now. So we're working with the biceps brachii in through here and it has its head I'll come underneath now the corcobrachialis is there and we I'll just indicate it's detached there we won't see it in this view it'll be covered up completely but that's where it's at right in through there now the biceps brachii will attach on top of it on the corcobrachialis in front come down with the tendon that longer tendon and get that head going like so and then that first and second head will roughly look together like this and we'll split them up in a moment. Right in through here will be the longer tendon and then there's the split there roughly and then the second longer tendon long head is on the lateral side of it so we see more of it it's major fuller head here and it will come in down and under and it was will actually go now underneath the olecranon Okay, so we can't draw it on top of the electron. There will twist and attach to the radius and the ulna as it opens up. So it's got to come underneath. So it will look like here now. <clears throat> excuse me. 
here and up. And I'll show you where it attaches after it comes up and through here and coming back over and underneath onto the radius, which we wouldn't see in the ulna too as well, just to give you an indication of that. It's good to know where these origins and insertions are just to see what they're going to do. There we go. Of course, all that's a tube curving around, curving around, and through here. So the brachialis will come in front with the extensor carpi radialis longus. So we'll come in front of that. Bulk, be bulkier here. And then we'll have to, I'll, I'll just separate them so we can see them just a little bit. And they'll curve and touch back over to the radius. So they attach around the, the break, break, brachialis, which I forget to show here. I'll, I go back and add, add a little quick addendum so you can see that. Now the long head of the lateral bicep, two heads, it goes through the intersulcar, intertubicular sulcus, intertubicular sulcus and then on top of the glenoid process right there where it attaches. So it's in that little groove <clears throat> that keeps it locked in. So there's our biceps area. There's the other tendon to the corco process. It's amazing that the biceps brachii, the two heads of the biceps do not at all attach to the Humerus. Now the brachialis is underneath that somewhat, a little bit hidden. I'm going to make that clear when I, I do an addendum at the end of this video. Now the deltoid will start to come over, lateral third of the clavicle, attaching in through here, coming on down and over these muscles, the biceps corcobrachialis, and attaching with the uh, anterior head to the deltoid tuberosity, then I come over. This is really running over here to the back, and this is really kind of the where the the, the lateral and the posterior head meet. And here's where the medial head is roughly eh, right in through here. So remember, we're covering up all the humerus scapula area, but we'll leave part of it to show through. We just want to. We want to kind of understand all of it together. So we'll do this drawing will show, resonate many different kinds of transparent like uh, applications. That's the point is to be able to see all of it and know what's what's going on. And then you don't really forget it. You just, you know, you put it in your long term memory and you start drawing, it comes back. If it doesn't, then you know you need still you still need work to do before you've memorized it. But you can. You can memorize all this to a very very high degree. It just takes effort. You look at Michelangelo Sistine Chapel and his studies for each pose, for the ignudi, the sibyls and prophets, and the stories of the creation stories. They're all, all were, were worked out poses that he observed and drew from. And of course, he did an anatomical studies as he did uh, anatomy work, cadavers, and then drawing from that. So lots of information. So getting back to this one, deltoid lateral head buckles in and through here a little bit just to give you the contouring and feeling of that. And remember this is over everything and attaches the deltoid tuberosity is a real workhorse of a of a spot on the bone of the humerus. Halfway down on the lateral more lateral side it really works hard bringing those deltoids in. So there's the deltoid in through it curves around. I'll clean this up a little bit later and make it a little, little bit clear. But that gives you some contouring around all that as well. We won't see much of the pectoralis. We know that the pectoralis comes down in over to the medial third of the clavicle and it will connect back up to the the greater tubercle crest underneath. Just clean this up a little bit, make that a little cleaner and clearer. The deltoids inserting there. 
There's nothing easy about this. It's I don't know if I make it look easy or not, but it's certainly challenging, you know, work. And I've i I'm not drawing from anything, but I do have. You can see the skeleton to the left of me, and then just right out of the camera, there's the Ecrige standing in front of me. Then I've got the little hand of the right hand of it detached. And if I need it, I'll and I'll show you. I actually pull it out in a little bit and show you when I need it but I'm not I'm not drawing from any anything observable I'm drawing from my imagination in testing my knowledge and then really being an example for you folks you guys and then also teaching you where these insert these muscles are at what their shape and form is so that you can do that now that now we're working on the triceps so what I do is I go back and I catch the bone a little bit clear it up this is where the two heads will attach on the scapula for the medial head right in through there and then for the uh, the lateral head will be on the humerus so let's get that shape so you know I've already got the shape of the triceps so this is more of the medial part the underneath part and, and then now we have okay so I'll show you where it's at so here's our humerus from the back right in through here where it'll attach the lateral and then the medial will attach to the scapula side where my finger just pointed this way down to the olecranon which we've got twisted a little bit or tilted <clears throat> so let's clean this up a little bit as I narrate this story so sometimes I like to narrate. It makes the drawing process easier. I don't have to talk during the drawing process. I can just draw and then talk later. So we have now the outer head, the lateral head of the tri the uh, triceps here. The medial will be covered up mostly in most views. And that tendon, I'll show you how that works in a moment. And we're going to get this a little bit higher. I think I have to go back and there you go. That's it. A little higher there. Over to the olecranon, the radial part of the olecranon. In through here, that nice long tendon head of both the triceps. Really, the two, the uh, lateral and the in the uh, medial, or the long head. Here we go. Okay. And now the medial attaches here, tendon coming down, and then it bulks into its, its head position. I tend to show a little bit more in this position maybe than what you'd get, but I, when I went back and looked at it, but I just realized I just wanted to show more of it. Now we get the medial head coming down, which is actually a little bit larger and longer. It's the same thing as the, the uh, gastrocnemius. The medial is, is uh, longer and lower. So we get the outer contour, which starts to work with the bicep muscle, bicep brachialis. And then they're going to come together in that split of the head, and then this turns. So we get the head, but it kind of turns in. So we're curving contour-wise this way. But then we're going to get a curve of the muscle form as it goes into the eponeurosis or the tendon, the greater tendon of the tricep, which is really thick and strong and works from the edge of the underneath part of your triceps muscle all the way down to your elbow, your, your uh, epicondyles. And it, has a, it kind of goes underneath right there. So that little curve, it has a way of turning in this way. So, And then we go to the tendons, long stranded tendons. This is kind of a the aponeuroses of the, of the uh, that wider area in, in textbooks is real long and kind of triangular, uh, rectangular, and down to the edges of the epicondyles here. So we have our tricep muscle on. Should remind you a lot of the the uh, gastrocnemius. Even though the gastrocnemius comes down to one point at the calcaneal bone to the Achilles. Now, the aconeus muscle, that triangular muscle, right in through here, resting on. Now I'm going to show you a little bit. So right in through here, okay. Right in through there. I just took it off the ecrige. 
it, you know, the post wound up kind of looking like this. I didn't really mean for that, but it came out looking like it. So there's the aconeus right in through there. Really triangular kind of shaped muscle, so I'll put it back on the ecorche in front of me. I've just probably drawn it and seen it so many times that I thought, okay, I'll just do a pose, and there it came out. So I guess it's pretty advantageous. Long tendons of the triceps. Down to the epicondyle. So let's clean this up, make it a little clearer with a little darker chalk, charcoal. Just giving some contour striation to this drawing. I'll clean that up even further later. You could spend hours doing it, like an engraving, but the point is to get the knowledge and then move on. Working on splitting that head up of the bicep a little. Two heads there. Tricep has three. The medial's underneath that. We don't see that too often. So cleaning up underneath here. Just keeping these two heads split in the deltoid first in layering. Number one in layering the deltoid in the upper arm region. It wraps over everything. Some people put it in the shoulder, I put it in the upper arm region. <clears throat> it's kind of that nice bridge between the upper arm and the and the shoulder girdle. Down to the electronon, electronon and then to the aconeus muscle. Give that some bulk. Kind of bringing that a little bit further, a little bit more definition. And then in our case here, as so we're drawing muscles. So pull that down again. Now we're going to look at the extensors. We're mostly in the extensor view here. The brachioradialis and the extensor carpi radialis longus, the extensor digitorum right in through here, right, pollicis muscles right at the tip of the forearm, and of course the extensor carpi ulnaris and the flexor carpi ulnaris will be at the bottom of the forearm where we'll get all those. And now there are more muscles than that. Don't get don't get deceived that that I don't know that they're underneath there or that we're missing some that may, may or not occur. We're, we're mostly concerned with the most superficial, not that they're superficial, not smart, meaning that they're the surface. They make the most surface formed delineation. That's why we don't study the pancreas or the liver when we study the abdomen. We don't study the lungs. That's for medical doctors. Too. We want to study bones, and muscles and ligaments and tendons so that we can draw them and make the human form come alive. So the extensor digitorum, remember that that's relatively in the middle and you know originating from the if it's extensor the more radial side so we have now coming over and twisting over to now and then creating the four tendons from the index finger to the middle to the ring to the pinky finger so we'll draw these tendons all the way over these top dorsal dorsal tendons and remember the flex the uh, palmar tendons of flexors is the flexor digitorum superficialis which gives tendons underneath our fingers we don't I've never seen tendons underneath because that's where fat pads are at underneath, so they're all going to get covered up. You see a lot of tendons on the top of the hand, especially in older folks when they age. When we age, your muscular people, or sometimes you can just hang it when you're looking at your hands. 
you'll see them in if the lighting is right, if the shadows are right, you can see quite a bit of tendons um, at, on the top of the of the hand for sure. Bottom of the hand, I never, I never see them. They're there, but they're there. They're there to help flex and control. Now on top of those metacarpals, those tendons run across. How do tendons stay on the hand? Well, they're wrapped by ligaments, by eponeurosis ligaments all over, especially at the knuckles, the joints, and at the body of the shaft, there's, there's ligaments. They go in X patterns too as well, they crisscross. All right, so now we have the extensor digitorum, and now we're working with the Let's see the uh, extensor carpi ulnaris and then the flexor, which will be to the side of it to give it the out to work, out, uh, outer contour in through there. So they line up pretty nicely in through here as they disappear into their respective originating areas. And we'll pop them out where they start to bulge. Now remember, they have a, a, a very short insertion, beginning insertion, originating from one of the two epicondyles and then their tendon is really long so the head of the muscle the muscle body is more like a hot dog or a frankfurt wiener if you will and then their insertion is pretty short uh, up to the con epicondyles but their tendons are quite long now we have the extensor Carpi ulnaris and the flexor, a little bit of the flexor we'll see to give it that final bulkier contour on the outside of it as well. These, these two muscles coming together a little bit. Check out the first diagram we did if you're confused and go check the book as well or go check the Ecrgey application just for help too as well if you're not quite sure there because where the flexors end, the extensors begin, and of course where the extensors end, the flexors begin. We don't see the pronator teres in this view. Uh, we only see it, or we see its, its, uh, its residue or its bulginess uh, in the more supinated uh, turn of the hand where the thumb turns over. We open up. This one's more closed. And we get the sty styloid process where the ulna was there. Clean this up a, a little bit. So we get about 10 more minutes here. So the aconionis triangular muscle to help the joint stabilize. And I'll start to just contour these muscles. Most of it's done now. And we'll just clean this up and make it clear to yourself to show you how to do that. And then we're going to drop down and put on some of the interosseous hypothenar and thenar uh, areas of the metacarpals and a little fat pads on the fingers where we'd see them. So you have to be careful with those fingers, you know. Sometimes from the metacarpal phalangeal proximal joint up to the distal, they're almost done when you put the bones on tendon. You just have the fat pads underneath and the nail just to make it, you know, look, look more real. You'll see a lot of Baroque Renaissance sculptors will leave that area pretty, pretty thin and fragile, and it works. So we have that coming down. We'll get to those in through here in a moment. So the pollicis muscles in through here, abductor pollicis longus. So the right there, there. See how they come out, and they kind of mimic the brachy, brachioradialis too. It's like there's another set of them, so it's attachment. Anyway, they come from the interosseous material and the ulna. The abductor longus comes from the ulna inside there, and the brevis comes from the interosseous material. But right in through here, and they come outward, give a little bit more bulk to the thumb area, and then those tendons will go to the joints of the anterior and posterior part of the joint of the thumb to give more tendon and movement in through that region and help with reaching across the opposable thumb to touch your pinky, your ring, your middle, and your index, and you can grab onto this. So I was reading the other night about which finger you could do away with the most, and, and believe it or not, it's your index finger. Try that. Stick, stick your finger up in the air like it's a number one, and then 
with the three fingers and your thumb, you can like, you know what, I can still do a lot without it. But if you lose your pinky, you're losing a lot of, a lot of uh, movement there as well. It's interesting that way. And I'm just throwing on a little bit of the torso muscle serratus anterior ribcage area just to give it more realism. And now we're, this is kind of just a little clean up part of the drawing just to make it clear for you and for the viewer and for me, the artist, whatever I see is the, your audience sees, so it's got to be clear and that's what we do. And uh, cleaning that up a little bit with some of the darker charcoal. Brachioradialis definitely comes out. We'll hide that brachialis a little bit. I'm going to add, include that once the main part of this video ends. I'm going to do a little addendum that I show you. Where I, I just kind of clean up where the brachialis can be. I want to make sure we get that aconianus in through here, the ulna part of the elbow proper, and then down and through here we get the other part of the condyle to make up that triangular part of your elbow, a little space there, and then the flexor and the extensor there, carpi ulnaris on the ulna edge, the edge of the ulna. Bulky head, short origination, very long, tending to get down to this this carpal area and then the metacarpal and on into the fingers as we use them where they attach ulnar area where the styloid process gets a little bulky there and then just cleaning these up we're starting to come together further Make these divisions a little stronger. There's a lot of uh, overlap. Superficial, excuse me, there's deeper muscles, deeper muscles underneath. We're just concerned with more of the superficial, meaning the surface here, the ulnar end, and then the extensor digitorum here. One of my favorite muscles, the powerful tendon. And it's amazing how it will split off into four little branches and will help control the movement of your fingertips, your, all your, your fingers. It's like the puppet master up by your elbow. Your elbow and your, your forearm muscles up there are your puppet masters, and your fingers are doing the dance. They're being controlled by those extensor and flexor muscles. Okay, Paulus is here. The extensor radialis on the edge. Paulus's muscles, they will bulk out a little bit. They do come out. Okay, they're, they're also called, when they, when they flex, you can kind of move your hand to the side, and it's called the anatomical snuff box. So a lot of people have talked about it. It's, I'll let you research that on your own. You can figure out, what is he talking about, the anatomical snuff box? Well, go and research that. Just type in anatomical snuff box, and it'll, it'll come up. Making these a little bit elongated with some striations here. Just about ready now to do the hand muscles further. Remember, there are three sets of interosseous muscles we group together, the dorsal, palmar, and the lumbrical. And then we're going to start with the hypothenar over here on the palm part of the pinky, right in through the side in through here. There's three muscles there. We group them together. They're the hypo. Thenar, T-H-E-N-A-R, and they give bulkiness to the palm, a lateral edge, so here it is right in through there, and there's, of course it's in conjunction with some fat pads to give you that fullness. And so it begins that contour right in through there, the outside part of the pinky, not on top now, but more to the lateral. Keep that in mind. Can't be on top. There's not much on top. Now, the interosseous muscles as I'm working here, they fit in between the metacarpals. Dorsal on top. There's palmar on the bottom. Lumbrical in between a few. There, those are even deeper that we they just don't show up. All of that, the bones, the the interosseous muscles make up the bulk with the tendons. They make up the bulk and the, excuse me, the fat pads. They make up the bulk of the top of the palm 
and the, the what we think of the true palm underneath with the ball of the thenar muscle in the outer kind of sausagey part of the hypothenar and then the the metacarpal grouping on the palm those are fat pads all that makes up that big blocky volumetric hand that we talk about talk about and draw that's the block or the egg form you'll see it all the time and that's what we start with. And so those muscles inside those metacarpals l allow your fingers to spread and close. Spread, open, and close. And then we have a little bit, we'll see a little bit of the thenar muscle. Is it, it's kind of, it's more webbed from the digit, the metacarpal over to the second metacarpal. through there. We don't see a lot of it there. Here we go. So it gives you some more mobility to those opening and closing fingers. Now, now we're ready for some fat pads on the metacarpals. I'm going to do a, do a couple and leave some empty. Now see I'm on the lateral side of that bone. I get a little bit of the medial side of it right in through here. You see a fat pad. And so the bone is curved underneath. And see how the fat pad goes over it to give, look at that. That gives you that sausagey finger-like expression. Now when we start drawing from ob more observational references, and I'll talk a little bit, I'll do a couple of close-ups of fingers and nails to talk about the nail. And so fat pad on the tip. So if you're a guitarist or if you play any stringed instrument or really anything with a tip of the finger, the sensitivity, that's a fat pad with nerve endings that are, that are deeper. So, but there's enough space in the fat pad, the fat pad takes a brunt. But you develop calluses. I play guitar, so like everybody in the free world plays guitar, but uh, those calluses develop on your tips of your fingers so that you're not pushing on bone. Fat pad, condyle here, right? And I'll do one. Let's do the thumb. We'll do the thumb and the, the index finger with the fat pad, and we'll leave the ring in the middle off so you just see the difference coming through here. So the top you won't see a lot, and then we're kind of getting to the side of the thumb. There's the tendon, fat pad underneath, okay? That free digit there, that free opposable thumb, and then fat pad underneath the distal there and the tip, and then you get that classic kind of curved up thumb shape. See what makes, now you know what makes the shape, or really the when we talk about the form, you know how the form now the thumb is made, and really all the fingers. You can control all of these. So there we go here. <clears throat> and a little bit of the bottom gets bulky, the tip, more triangle to follow the distal and the nail could come out and just a little bit, the contouring of that there. And there's the end of the bone and the fat pad underneath, like before. So we get that kind of extended thumb and the, the uh, pinky finger is more attached back. Kind of a graceful pose. Metacarpal phalangeal joint with the proximal fat pad underneath. We see a little bit of that, almost covered up. Bone, look how arched the bone is in, and then fat pad. So the fat pad can fit in that groove. So that makes sense. And then the fat pad will be for the tip. In through that region there. For almost, almost got it. Pretty close to getting all our parts together here. And a nail will come out of that, that keratin part of the nail. And those can get, you can damage your nail. I've damaged, those of you who know my right hand, my thumb, is most of that nail is about halfway just damaged. I put a sheetrock screw into it. I'm right-handed, I had to use my left hand for the gun, the sheetrock screw gun, and, and uh, for a little tight point, it, kind of hopped off the wall and then went right into my thumb. Luckily it didn't go too deep, but it kind of damaged the nail. The nail never grew back well, and so it, it comes in all kind of dead looking, so I just I cut it back. Well, I guess you didn't want to know all that, but uh, TMI, but there you go. All right, so that's I mean an interesting kind of biological anatomical thing that happens. So I'm going to clean this up a little bit. 
a little further you can see how to do that and of course you could take this really really cleaned up you could do it ultra tight finished drawing from this would take another hour or two that's not the point here I think we've got all the anatomical parts from the deltoid to the distal tip that we wanted deltoid the deltoid shoulder all the way to the distal fat pad of each each finger which does which serves us really well and we'll just clean up this deltoid so all that we just understand that all this is covering up the humerus the clavicle the scapula the tendons of the coracobrachialis muscle the biceps brachii triceps all that good stuff scapula it's all covered up a little bit so we're just about there so what I want to do now let me go in and we'll slide over to the brachialis uh, muscle Okay, now I slide to the brachialis. So right under the biceps brachii, the brachialis might show up right in through there. I want to make sure you see that. So that brachialis would be there. We don't want to forget about our buttery, the brachialis muscle. We didn't get the coracobrachialis. I could do more active diagrams, but I think I'm. This will be the only one. I think you you've seen enough of these where you can start to do these really on your own and get a good feel for uh, all that uh, is entitled, entailed with uh, doing all of this. All right, so there you go. There's from the distal to the deltoid. See you later. Bye-bye.